Um, but today our speaker is Kevin O'Connell. Kevin was one of the first WeWork members I met here, uh, here in Crystal City, and uh, it was kind of funny. We met on accident. He left a poster I'm on a door. My, I'm telling my story. I was going to Oh, you're going to? No, 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 no. I'm not. I want you to quit it. Quit it. <laughs> He's an awesome guy. He knows a lot about uh, like social media and branding. He runs this really great um, movement that he's going to talk about, I'm sure. But uh, he has a lot of good things to say. I'm really excited we have an opportunity for him to speak. And I will stop stealing his time and let him talk about it. You want the microphone? Uh, I think I'm good. I think uh, as, as long as everybody can hear me back there. Uh, so yeah, as Andrew said, my name is Kevin. I have an office right down that corridor right there. I've been here since opening of February 1st. And uh, it's, it's just crazy how like the world works its way out, uh, both online and in person. And, and so what he was alluding to start saying is, Back in February, we brought back uh, our second season of a podcast for one of my organizations, The Niche Movement, which I'm going to talk about. And we left, stupidly, we put like a, you know, please be quiet, recording sign. If you'd like to be on our podcast, please co contact Kevin. And we left it up. And I think the next, the next morning, Andrew, again, was the first one that sent me an email and said, hey, I saw what you guys are doing. It's awesome. Love to be on the podcast. And now uh, a nice relationship is born. My wife and I went out with his wife. Uh, and so now it's just kind of a way to start meeting people. So I, I definitely give kudos to the WeWork community and just some chance luck. So the two things that I do is I run a digital storytelling agency. We focus a lot on social media strategy, branding, photo, and video. And the other passion project of mine that has now turned into a grassroots movement across the country is the niche movement, the niche movement. And uh, really what that is is a community of young professionals helping others find the work they love. And we do that through a variety of platforms in a variety of ways. And so when Andrew uh, finally twisted my arm to get me on the schedule for today, I kind of was racking my brain. What could I talk about that would lend the most value to pivotal employees, as well as maybe startup employees, solopreneurs, et cetera, here in the DC WeWork community? So real quick show of hands, just so I know who I'm working with. Who works with Andrew at Pivotal? Awesome. Enjoy your lunch break. Thank you for coming up. Um, who works here in, in, uh, at WeWork as a startup? Okay, keep your hands held if you are a solopreneur or have a one or two person operation. Okay, awesome. So I think what I've put together will hopefully start to uh, relate and, and resonate with both you as a solopreneur, potentially even the work you're doing with Pivotal um, or with a larger organization. I really think uh, what I'm going to share is going to be beneficial. So first thing I'd like to start out with is this quote from somebody I really look up to is Gary Vaynerchuk. And so he said, everybody has a voice now and your voice can travel. And really... I think between written form of blogging to podcasting to having this device on us 24-7 right by our bedside, we can literally create a brand, a name for ourselves, and, and amplify what we have to say in the category we want to say it in. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today is some of the traditional methods that still sometimes work today, how they've transformed and where they're going in the next five years. And so I really like to talk about we have three months left in the year, but what is happening in social media marketing and digital storytelling going into 2017? And so I first uh, want to get into a couple statistics, but the second thing is if you think about it, uh, I just taught a class last night at General Assembly. It was on the startup culture, how to get a job in startups, and every single person there, they all said they didn't want to work for the man or the machine, and they were, they were you know, upset with the hierarchical process of, of big companies, and they value things like transparency and open and honest communication and relational leadership. And we as consumers expect the same out of the brands and the companies and organizations that we resonate and connect with. And so I put this image up there because I think the best piece of advice and the, the number one thing that I'm doing right now with my two organizations is I'm peering and letting people in the social media peephole of my company. I'm letting them see a, a day in the life of what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, when things go well, and to be honest, when things don't go well. And that has really attracted, as me being a solopreneur with a small company right now from New Jersey, been down here in, for two years, we have created traction. Uh, in, you know, we don't have millions of followers or views, but in, in our world, we have people listening. They are gravitating towards our message. And so that's the second thing out of everything we talk about today. If you can think of, you have a voice, you can now tell it through a variety of mediums. And the second thing is the more you can create that kind of openness, whether it's for yourself as an organization, or some of you out there that do work full time, it could be right now to create a more personal brand for yourself to go on and get another job somewhere else. So the first stat I want to start with, 
What percentage do you think of consumer social media traffic will be through video by the end of 2016? Who wants to shout out and guess a number? Forty percent. Jess is too low. Keep going. What else? Sixty percent. You are pretty close. So sixty-nine percent of social media traffic is going to be through video. Okay, that is a that is a big big number to think about right now, and that's just capturing the, your four or five major social media platforms. This statistic blew my mind in a one year uh, time frame. This is Facebook specific. So daily video views on Facebook has jumped from one billion daily views to eight billion daily views in one year this year. So let's just call it what it is. Facebook is going to compete with YouTube. That's what they are doing. And they're competing with NBC and CBS. They're competing with all these other big networks as well as YouTube, your streaming and Netflix type of things. 100 million of those hours have been on a mobile device. Go figure. Uh, watching, this is a very interesting one for those of you into branding, marketing, growing your organization. For watching videos about products and companies, you're four times more, people are four times more popular than imagery or written word. So we are, we are more interested through video because you can seek emotion, transparency, genuineness versus reading a blog. Um, they are still very relevant to this day, but a video, you can really get more of a connection and it's just something people unfortunately aren't reading as much as they were. Uh, this one, this is, an, is another interesting statistic. 135%, if you have video and animated content, has 135% greater organic reach than photos. And so I remember two to three years ago talking about this and being like, you have to have an image when you share a tweet. You have to have an image when you put on Facebook. Now, you have to have a GIF or a video. And, and the really cool thing, and because where I'm at, I have a very tight budget. Uh, recently, I've spent some, some, you know, you see on Facebook, you can boost a post. You can also go in the back end of ad managers and, and do some dark post targeting. I've spent money there. But the really cool thing, because you, when you have a tight budget, you may not have five, 25, 100, 200 dollars to boost your posts and get or, uh, you know, paid media reach. Doing video, you get a lot more organic reach on Facebook. And I'm going to share a couple examples. And this is, this is hilarious. Craig Adams is a fellow YouTube content creator in New York City. He's a young kid, about 23. But he tweeted this, kids today see a photo online and they're like, dude, your GIF is broken. So that's just where, if you think where 16 to 18 to 20, 20 years old are, they want the video content. Here's another one. I'm curious what you, if anybody knows and wants to guess a statistic. Uh, people watching Facebook video without sound, what do you guys think it is? Did someone t take a guess? 80%? You're pretty spot on. 85%. So I, I found a statistic like a month or two ago and I tested it with my own, my own content. Sure enough, it's like 82.3 spot on. And why? Because we're on the metro, we're in bed next to our partner, we're at work, we don't like. And so the big thing that I've been doing with our clients is breaking up our content and adding translation to it. And that's where sometimes we're losing it, where we're, oh, we have this, this video we spent $5,000 on, it's three minutes long, and then you throw up on, on Facebook and people watch four seconds of it because they can't get a sense of what they are watching. Because they're in the car, they're on the metro, they're falling asleep, they're in a setting where they can't listen to audio or they don't have, they lost their earbuds. So keep these statistics in mind uh, as about what I'm about to talk about. So here's um, the other thing, is Twitter is jumping in the game. Last night, you could live stream watching it right on Twitter. So they are creating partnerships. With the NFL, you can, since two or three Thursday nights ago, you can now live stream the NFL games on your device. And so they're doing this because people are mobile. People are out and about, and people can watch it from their iPad or iPhone. So one of the things I, that I believe, and, and just from working with clients, people that have large budgets, small budgets, etc., we are still in this mindset when we, think, when we think the word video, we think of this right here, Rachel's camera from Pivotal and my camera, right? I'm documenting this. We think video production, thousands of dollars, high level cameras, we need a team, right? Yes, for some things that you are doing, you need to be high level and produced and, and have a genuine uh, piece of content out there. However, we lose speed with that. 
Most projects that I've been working on take two to four to five to six weeks. So by the time that content is released, it's already six weeks old. There's no storytelling, there's no behind the scenes, there's, no, there's nothing happening. It's just like working, working, working behind the scenes and all of a sudden here's a video, like let's watch it. Um, the other thing we get caught up on is money. So again, in somebody like my position, maybe some of yours, you might think you need a ton of money to create video content. Sure, every now and then you will, but I can't tell you how much just picking up an iPhone and filming in your office or documenting what you're doing in DC and putting that on Snapchat, Twitter Live, Periscope, or Facebook, you might have a really big organic reach from that piece of content. The other thing is quality. Uh, that's the other thing is, is how many of you have watched the video in the last week that has been not high produced quality but you've enjoyed it? Yes, right? So it's more about the person behind the camera, the story, and what they're talking about. Like right now, there's not good lighting, uh, the audio may not be as good, but the content might be good. So I think you need, these are other things that we need to start kind of creating the paradigm shift around. Both not just for ourselves personally or as a small organization, but bigger organizations need to realize it's about speed and fast pace and, and doing more with less money. And the last one is the story. There's so many things that can be documented in your career journey, in your organization's journey, that it's all about the story and the process. And again, sometimes working on, on shoots and, and creating a, a quality video, that takes time and all of a sudden the story might be missed or you can't get somebody to come record your event. So I think the story is a really, good, is a really big piece. So what does this mean for everybody here? This is my personal example. I have a handful of videos on my YouTube channel, but this I recorded. I was running out the door at 4.35 last week to go into DC. I needed to record a message because we just, had a, we just created an open letter for the niche movement community about our conference coming up, and I wanted to have a video go along with it. So I set up a gorilla pod, I set up my iPhone, I turned on the little light that they all provide you here at WeWork, I have a mic here underneath me, and I did a four minute video. I didn't know what to expect. A lot of these videos every now and then I put on YouTube will get 50 views, 100 views, 200 views. In 48 hours, this, this video had 485 organic views by embedding it directly on Facebook. So that's the power of the, the statistics and what Facebook is trying to do. They want people to have video. And the really interesting thing is it's really organic. People are watching. You can, you can get data of how many people have watched and how far they've watched along. And, uh, and because it was also about, it was really open and honest communication to our community. And so that was a very personal example because 485 to me, that's a lot. To some other organizations, that may not be a lot. But to me, that was a, that was a pretty big spike for a piece of content. And that was Facebook Live. Was so this was just a regular video. Uh, I didn't do Facebook Live. I, I, want, I, I did a one take video. And I think that's the other thing is trying to do things in one take. I did it one take, upload it there, then upload it to YouTube so I could throw it through Twitter. Uh, but because I embedded it directly, this was uh, here. And the other thing, I don't know, how, does anybody have access on their personal Facebook account to do live video? I know my company profile does, and mine personal one is coming on, but does anybody have access to do Facebook Live? So they're testing the waters. They're testing it, they're testing with certain individuals at certain times in certain regions, and I, I guarantee by the end of 2017, everybody will have access to do a Facebook Live video. So how does this play into what I want to talk about today and what I learned? So our community, so I run my digital storytelling agency, my passion project is the niche movement. Uh, we have a very small budget and very small allocations for resources and time. And we are a community of young professionals. I'm very fascinated. Uh, so I finally interviewed Andrew. He was one of our podcast guests. I'm very fascinated about capturing stories in the written form, audio form, and video form of people that love what they do. You know, was there career, career trajectory a jungle gym and not perfectly straight? Or, or did they land their first job right out of college? So I want to capture these stories in a variety of forms. but. I want to expand outside of the DC network. And we have very limited team, and we only have one office here, and, uh, and we were only founded three, three years ago. So the problem is, is we identify that there's, we have 25 contributing editors. We also have people that work all across the country that love what they do. How do we tell their story without me traveling with my camera, paying for airfare, because I can do my time, but how do I do that? How do I tell their story when I can't be there physically or monetarily, right? So we are 
we basically started pinpointing all these people that signed up, like, hey, I want to tell my story, I want to tell my story, I want to be interviewed. So I could have done a podcast, but I want to seek some more emotion and a little bit longer than a 20 or 30 minute podcast that was a little bit more formal. The really cool thing is we were able to reach London and all the way as far as Iceland with this. So what we did is we turned to Snapchat and we figured out if we could flip the lid on employee recruitment and engagement, could we hand over somebody that works at Twitter our Snapchat account and say, hey, document a day in the life of your Twitter office. Why do you love working there? Who do you work with? How'd you get the job? We went to Snapchat. And I'm sure as many of you already use Snapchat, you may not be familiar with all these statistics, it has been, it's blown Facebook out of the water. It's the fastest social media app. This was from 10 million to 100 million active users. That was from April of 2012 to May of 2015. This statistic is already outdated. Uh, it has 7 billion daily video views as of January 16th. That statistic is probably double right now. And the other interesting thing, 67% of the active users is, are 18 to 34. So again, if you're target marketing, what you're trying to do is that age range, you should be doing something on Snapchat. Now there's Instagram stories, just as popular. I do think Snapchat has about a 10 or 20% market on, on these stories right now. So we turn to Snapchat. And so what wound up happening is people that love what they do signed up and we were able to document a day in the life of from London, from New York City Tech Day, here in Washington, D.C., somebody that works for General Assembly, all the way to somebody that uh, had their, literally like a week earlier, had their startup bought by Pinterest out in San Francisco. And that kid's like 22 years old on the far right. So what I want to do real quick is I have two videos to share today. I want to share this first one to kind of show you the highlight of what we put together by using our Snapchat account. My name is Mary Johnson and I'm here because I work for HBO. Hey guys, I'm Melanie. I work at Twitter, also author of Bold, Get Noticed, Get Hired. My name is Jordan Luby. I'm the Director of Marketing for Maryland Athletics. I'm Mallory Corcoran, the Training and Development Manager at Chloe and Isabel. My name is Bridget and I am the Studio Production Assistant here at the Dr. Oz Show. I'm a senior creative producer at a company called Whistle Sports and my elevator pitch for that is a combination of ESPN and BuzzFeed. It's not like we're in Iceland, the most beautiful country ever. Mike Greenberg doing work, ladies and gentlemen. And action. Oh, yeah, just a drone shot to finish today. We have seven people on our staff, and each of us are responsible for the revenue and attendance generation and then the game experience, game presentation for specific sports. Uh, mine is football. Play a big role in our branding efforts, i.e. this type of stuff. So um, we're working on the branding for our next academic year. So here's a little sneak peek. Yeah, so just a little bit of what I do. I am the head of growth marketing at Notion Theory. I love being with an innovative team. We are currently working with virtual reality as well as 3D printing. So a tech day and I'm loving it. So one of the things I love about Notion Theory is uh, the first day I started working, my CEO told me, never ask permission. Just do it and tell me how it goes. I love it. I work with the corporate social responsibility team at HBO and we handle all of the philanthropic initiatives. So we're on the red carpet. This is my boss, Pam Hacker. Hi. Melanie Torres and Jana Herman. We tape two shows a day. When we tape, I am the A show, so I had to be here at 7. <laughs> All right, guys, this is a really valuable experience for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hey, that's a wrap. I'm leaving work now. I hope you were inspired by my day and what I do for work. I sure had fun doing this. So we, when we launched this, we weren't really sure how this would go. Uh, we launched it April 1st of this year. And since then, we've had about 75 professionals from all across the world take our handle over and, and share a day in the life of. But really, the, the really interesting thing is it's been a twofold opportunity, not only for the niche movement community, but for the people that have actually done it. The last girl, Mallory, who runs Chloe and Isabel, actually said, wow, I've never actually like, used Snapchat physically, and I did a full day of it, and now I want to implement it into my company. Other people said, wow, this is a really great way for me actually to reflect on what I do for a living and why I love what I do. Um, as well as we've had community people that have watched these Snapchat stories 
and said, you know, people put their email at the end and be like, if you want to contact me, please do. And they now have had opportunities to connect and email and share resumes, et cetera. And uh, so it's been a really unique challenge, but going into this, we had a strategy, but we didn't know what to expect. And so the story that I want to share now and why I'm talking so much about video is because the story I'm going to share next shows a lot of emotion, a lot of ups and downs, and it's authentic and genuine. I think that's what our generation is seeking from a job search side and trying to figure out, you know, is this a really good place to work or what's it like to be a school teacher or a production assistant. And so this first story that we did uh, was a school teacher in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I believe she was an art teacher. And um, two days prior, she had some interesting news. We didn't know this at the time, but I'm going to let you guys watch the video. And this is why the power of Snapchat in a video is better than trying to capture this on a written word or blog or, or through a tweet. Good morning. It's almost 7, which means got to make my lunch, got to brush my teeth. Gotta go, but I hope you enjoy following me today. Should be fun. Also, a very important part of my morning is, is putting on perfume. I've never been into that, but I get like at least 200 hugs a day. I'm not exaggerating. Kids like when I smell good. Like, it's bad enough that, okay, my last name is Moore, so I miss Moore from here on out when I leave today. Um, and I've been called Smelly Moore because apparently I smell good. Um, I'm gonna narrate this because I don't wanna be talking while I'm driving and snapping. Um, my commute is kind of an interesting one because snaps aren't long enough. So I go through the wealthiest area of Kansas City across a road called Troost, which goes to the poorest area. The school I'm in, 99% free and reduced lunch, so watch the change. All jokes aside, I love listening to music in the morning before and after work. It really helps me kind of unwind or get ready for the day. But now here's my commute. So despite the fact that it's really rainy, this is the plaza, which is like a super wealthy shopping area, Spanish architecture, very pretty, very nice, very wealthy. The discrepancy is weird because my students all live in what you'd call really the hood, and I live in this generally nicer area over by the plaza, so it's kind of weird when they know and I tell them I live over there. It's also just weird because um, it's such a transition and I never spend time over in that area except when I'm at work and generally I try to get out quickly, it's not safe. This is Troost Avenue, which is known as the dividing factor. East of Troost, most people in Kansas City never go because they don't feel it's safe. So this is the line where it turns into something else. Here, right next to my school, just very small houses. That one's a meth house. Um, my school's right there where the bus is. Work. Now, to be clear, I feel very safe at my school. The neighborhood around it, not so much at night. But um, it's a dual language Spanish English school. Uh, let's go inside. You thought the best part of being a teacher was summer vacation. Oh, usually there's a lot of free milk in here. Here we go. Free milk whenever you want. Good morning. Take out your chairs. Come to the carpet, please. Yes. Yeah. My kids are already gone. We have support or specials first thing, so they're at computers. So I got like 40 some minutes to plan. We're making puppets today. Pretty cool thing, every kid at my school has access to their own laptop, so they stay in this, which is called the cow. Her name is Bessie. So that's pretty neat. We have classroom pets. This is Sam. Is he not the cutest frog you've ever seen? I know some people aren't into frogs, but I think he's a pretty cute little dude. Students are here, it's going to be a lot less easy just to like chat like this. But these are the greatest books ever. Better than Junie B. Jones. My Weird School, if you're a teacher or a parent, mmm. I like to keep things in this little dumpster, like confiscated stuff from the kids that they're playing with. I keep jelly beans and the eggs for rewards, and they like to decorate my desk. De also that big ass trophy, we won that because we had the best attendance last week. We had like 99 point something percent. There's a big push for good attendance, so. Finalmente, inglés en mi escuela es lectura y uh, los ciencias sociales y uh, escritura y matemáticas y ciencias son en español. A few reflections. Being a teacher, I think, is a very isolating job because you're with kids all day, which is great, but you never really get to have real conversations with adults. Sometimes it's just very isolating. You never have time to chat or have lunch. Also, I have not cried today. Many days I cry at work because there's just very sad, difficult things my students go through. 
Um, I can't even begin. I mean, 10 seconds in a snap. Mm -mm. I, the one thing I would vouch is I have amazing volunteers. If you have a high need school in your area, go help. Ask if they need books. Ask if they need copies. Take an afternoon for an hour and go help. It makes a huge difference. In case you didn't know, schools are funded by the zip code taxes. So since the zip code we're in, this area really poor, crappy houses. So little taxes, no money. So your resources are needed. Another day, another dollar. I'm pooped, like most days. Those kids have a lot of energy. If you've ever been in my shoes where you don't know if you're ready to make a change, but you feel like it's probably the right thing to do, message me with some advice. I would appreciate it. I think one of my videos didn't post. Basically, I got a job offer as an art teacher at a different school, and I don't know if I should take it or not because I'm so attached to these kids. Yes, Andrew Murphy, if you see this. So that was Kate Moore. Uh, she did a 13 minute video and at first I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be so long, but like, the f it was the first week we did it. We had like, she had literally like a 90% open rate from her first snap to her last snap. And I think it was one, because of her personality and two, her, she was super genuine. And it really hit home to the core of what the niche movement is about is figuring your career and life and your 20s out is really difficult. And we were just blown away on how well she told her story and, and these stories just kind of continued to escalate. And um, we wound up at the end of the first month doing like Snapchatter of the month and we kept this going and she obviously won. Uh, but that what we wound up doing and what I want to kind of talk about is doing Snapchat guest stories or Instagram stories, that's not new. WeWork's doing it, the MLB does it, there's plenty of accounts and big and small corporations that do it. What we tried to do from the beginning was to DJ our content. And so that would be my other piece of advice is as you create these videos, uh, be it professional, be it on the phone, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever, is learn to DJ your content. And what I mean by that is we were very particular about downloading every single story at the end of the next day. One, because we want to have an archive to create a highlight reel like I showed you previously. Two, we want to go back and be able to cut up different parts um, to share with other college students and create like an archive on our website so you could look up I want to be a teacher and here you can watch all the snaps to be a teacher or in marketing or a startup whatever um, but we then started utilizing a couple other ways to grow that followership so I'm sure some of you may be familiar like well Kev snapchat doesn't have a big discovery function right how did you grow your audience well we used our other platform so at the end of of one day, the next day we would screenshot something or create, a, create the video, throw it on YouTube. We then threw it on Twitter and we now can use this as a kind of a marketing tool to say, hey, if you love your story, watch the other stories. Uh, we threw up screenshots of every single Snap story, either in real time on Instagram or the next day. So this was a girl, Chelsea from South Carolina, who just did a takeover. She works at Farm to Five in South Carolina and uh, she just did this the other day. And so our team snaps, uh, screenshotted, put together a little collage. So now all her friends that she's tagged and she sees it, so our followership grows that way. Um, we also will screenshot stuff like this and throw it on our Facebook account the next day or, or again in, in real time. And the other cool thing is quotables. So there's a lot of good things that people have said, like why they got into the field they did or they share a piece of advice we would then take them and turn them into a design and share like the three or four pieces of advice that that professional shared. And so what we're doing might be different than what you might wind up doing, but it's a way to realize that yes, Snapchat content, Instagram content goes away, but it's a way you can still download it and repurpose it on your other platforms for other purposes. And then the other thing, aside from now showing videos and doing different things like that, we wound up creating a webinar. So we, create, we, we did a free webinar, on the seven, the seven lessons learned of people who love their job. And we talked about seven of the other young professionals of the ups and downs and, and how they got to where they are. And we created a, another avenue for, to grow our community. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to make sure is, is I know I have 30 minutes to talk. I would love to take some Q&A in a minute. Um, but I, I think the, the one challenge I would have to you is whether you are starting up, solopreneur, small company, or you're an individual working for an organization right now and you're trying to figure out how do I position myself and, and create a personal brand for myself is 
there's plenty of opportunities to create video content and get yourself out there. And so I think starting documenting versus thinking I need, I need a big camera, I need a budget, I need to film for one day, I think breaking off into micro content on an every single day basis gets you into more of a habit and gets your followers and, and gets content out there versus overthinking it. And so the question I'd love to pose to you is, how can you challenge the, the traditional convention of storytelling and find a new way to tell your story? Thank you, guys. <laughs>